Hello, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. And welcome to another Patreon. Yes. Order of the Garter episodes. Yep. Well, we have one or two patron-based parochial messages. Mm-hmm. First one, was Isabella too delicious? Because we left it up to... Uh, Yes, to them. We we uh, we reneged on our duty, <laughs> and panicked, and said, "No, you do it." So yes, yeah, she was by um, sixteen votes to one. Nice. Mm, I presume the one against had the same qualms that I had, which were which were burning people and expelling yes. Jews. <laughs> yes, which yeah. are kind of big ones. But if that's not the case, perhaps they get in touch with us and let us know why they didn't think she deserved it. Yeah, that maybe be they just didn't like her. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I felt a tinge of guilt about her, or well, more than a tinge, in fact, at times. Yeah, but I mean, plenty of monsters have got the Rex Factor and Jenny Cesar. And... Yeah, Edward the First is a glaring one for yes. Rex Factor because he was well, brutal. He was hardly not going to get it, was he? No. And there are a number of horrific Totalis Rankium emperors. That yes. Got it. So chew delicious, despite the fact it's got licious in it, doesn't mean <laughs> delicious. No. Secondly, what are the patrons called? Oh, what did would they decide? Well, there were three front runners: courtiers, Tudor roses, and aglets. Mmm. So, do you have a preference, or should we do it by lucky draw, or? We should do it by lucky draw, I think. Okay, hang on. Let me jot it down on a couple of these bits of paper. Tearing it in half. Just showing I'm I'm actually really... Whoops, you think me? There goes the thing. Right. Tudor Roses. That's TR. Uh, What was the other one? Courtiers and Aglets. And Aglets. Okay. Punch them up. And the winner is Tudor Roses. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's quite sweet. I quite that like that. That is very sweet. <laughs> I like so that a we lot. Are. Welcome, Tudor Roses. The, lastly, we have some new Tudor Roses to thank. Linda Yancey, Sarah Traum, Slothinator, oh, Jessica Letts, <laughs> Joan Hargrove, Elspeth Olsen, Amanda Hayes, Sheena Nichols, Jill Osmond, Robin McHugh, Courtney Smotherman, Kaz, Mon Jilton, wow. and Danaja FP. Holy cow, that's a load of people. Thank it you so it. much. Yeah. Sheena Nichols, I recognize from chatting with her on Twitter and yeah. see her on Facebook. Yeah, there's a few few names there. Mm-hmm. Slothinator got in touch because they are doing, or they're planning to do, a podcast about similar lines about persian rulers so if you're still planning to do that then let us know and we'll give it another plug when yeah yeah when it's up and running yes be prepared it's a lot of fun a lot of work but a lot of fun (laughs) i keep going back to it's a lot of fun (laughs) it is a lot of fun yes yeah i spent most of yesterday sitting in the garden it was really hot yesterday it's raining today just reading about leonardo Mm. and I, i could do it because it was sort of work it wasn't I'd felt hey. guilty just sitting in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> said I would do the episode, so oh man, it's, it's a good excuse just to sit and read. Yeah, and it's so nostalgic for me to go back to the university and do my research in the library. <laughs> and it hasn't changed. I keep expecting it to be completely different, but the library looks exactly the same. The campus is massive now, and there's three new buildings, but the library is exactly the same. They haven't even changed the carpet. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, that's quite nice. Mm -hmm. I can't go back to my university because it's an open university, so I'm here. Ah, (laughs) green university all the time. In this very place. (laughs) Yeah, very wonderful institution, the open university. Anyway, first of all, this is a more interactive episode than usual. So Ooh. do you have pen, p- paper to hand? I do. So people right. are going to hear me writing. Okay. Let me make a noise here while I readjust my desk. It's not for a little while, but um, I'll let you know when when it's coming. Okay. I've got pen. I've got paper. I am ready to learn and try. That applies to the listening several as well. If they want to get paper and pencil, you can join in. Nice. 
So everything I'm about to tell you refers to medieval ideas about the human body, but mm -hmm. medicine hadn't changed at that time. Well, at the time we're looking at at the moment. People invented new techniques, as we saw in the syphilis episode, with the skin grafts repairing nasal cartilage. Mm -hmm. But the thinking behind medicine was trapped in Galen's four humours system, and it stayed that way for hundreds of years. And it really held everything back, I think. Yes. If we do another episode about the body in future seasons, we can begin to look at change then, as there were advances in the 16th century. Paracelsus, who lived from around 1493 to 1541, shifted away from the four humours and introduced many other cures based more on what he saw rather than what he thought he ought to see. And he's on our list of the Patreon feed, so we might get to cover him. Mm -hmm. But the time we're covering, ideas of medicine and anatomy were definitely medieval. Although Muslim knowledge had taken up wherever Muslim and Christian cultures met, like North Africa and Spain. And that gradually spread. However, we shouldn't patronise history to make us feel better about ourselves. We shouldn't use our understanding of science to belittle their beliefs. What they thought made perfect sense to them. And not because they're all idiots. <laughs> Some of them are actually been idiots, but not all of them. <laughs> but because they used what knowledge they had and extrapolated from that, just as we do today. Yes. But however crazy we might find some of their ideas, it has to be remembered that the reason they lasted so long was because they had an internal logic. I mean, if you start from point A and follow logical stepping stones, you'll reach point B. But unfortunately, mm. if point A is wrong, then point B will be. Reaching point B is pretty irrelevant and possibly dangerous if you're relying on prescribing medicines based on that. Yeah, and I've been doing some research on something completely different, and it brought up something that I hadn't really thought of. We have a completely different way of being raised right now. During the Tudor era and most of medieval time, they were taught to accept everything. Yes, I'm they coming were, to that a bit later, yes. Yeah, not t taught to question at all. That was actually stepping outside of your... Oh, I see. Ex accept authority, you mean? Yes. Oh, I thought you meant accept disaster. No, no, except authority. You were not allowed to question the church. You couldn't question the monarch. You couldn't question your parents. You couldn't question anybody who was above you. You do not question. You just do what you're told and you accept it. So mm. it, it carries through on a lot of things. And I think that stagnated in invention. Like nobody was willing to question. They really must have done, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why these medical ideas lasted so long was because Everybody's taught to accept it. This is mm. the truth. This is what it is. This is what we go with. Yeah. And then when humanism came in, the classics were sacrosanct, weren't they? I mean, yes. As we'll, we'll see a bit later. Yeah. But they knew better than you. How dare you think you know better than them? Which is odd because humanism looked forward mm -hmm. by by being stuck you know, thousands in the past. of thousands yeah. of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's strange. such an odd way to think, but like, I was thinking about it when I was talking to one of my friends and one of her kids was having a bad day and she said, well, why do you think it went this way? And I was like, that is n probably something that nobody would have ever asked in Tudor England of a child. Well, I'm trying to think possibly up till fairly recently, parents didn't speak to their children like that. No. I mean, you didn't care what your children thought. You didn't even think they did, I don't think. No. <laughs> no. I mean, when did the children are there to be spoken to and not heard? Mm. When did that go away? Yeah. But, yeah, mm. it's just such a completely alien way of being brought up. And then you start wondering, well, where was the switch? And yeah. it turns out it's Protestantism, at least everything so far that I've seen. The fact that they were starting to question the church opened everything up to being questioned. Yeah, I suppose it probably would have done, wouldn't it? Because the church mm. was the main one that you didn't question. Yeah, so the Tudor time is the perfect time. It, I think the Protestantism is the basis of that social change and the acceptance that the past could be wrong and we need to look at other options. Mm. So, sorry, that's totally off topic, but well, that's what I've like been reading about in the last couple of weeks. And I was just like, wow, 
It's such a hard way to wrap my head around it. How could you not think this was weird? Because they were taught not to think that way. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's the beauty of the way we've got this po- this podcast so- set up, that we can go completely off topic with things that we want, <laughs> and and it's it just it joins everything together. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's a fantastic. Oh, oh, oh. Um, totally off topic. Talking about mm-hmm. nurture, I found a book on uh, Gutenberg Library. It's called The Book of Nurture. It was written in 1416. Oh, I've seen it's that. How to raise... Yeah, that's yes. one of the things I've been reading. It is very cool. It's a little hard to read because it is in Tudor English, very mm. much so. So there's like they still use the character of the thorn for yeah. th that <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> now I've wow. used a bit. I've used some of some of that book for the uh, Tudor treats on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, and mentions going back into the Paston letters, Elizabeth Paston, one of the Elizabeth Pastons, when she questioned her parents, was beaten badly. Mm. So that would tell you not to question it either. You're not going to do it again, are you? No. Yeah, different world entirely. But at least that might give you an idea of why they believed the medieval thing was the way to go for so long. Yeah. Yeah, and because, as I'll sh- sh- show... It does seem perfectly logical. Once you've bought into the ideas of the four humours, everything about it fits. Really? It's a bit like conspiracy theories, isn't it? Cause, um, and that's why people who believe in conspiracy theories can't understand why other people don't believe it, because their theory has an internal logic, yes. often based on something strange like numerology or something, isn't it? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and why everything happens on a Tuesday and these sort of yes. things. But... If you if you follow the logic, then you'd you'd think to, about other people. But it's so logical. Why can't you see yeah. it? Yeah. And you think well because it's mad. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> if you yeah, if you start with the idea that humans are correct interpretation of how the bodies work, every assumption you make after that, however logical, unfortunately, takes you further and further away from what we would now Reality. see as the truth. Yeah. Yes. They'd all, they just didn't have the accumulated knowledge that we, we can call on today. And, you know, in a few hundred years, they'll be saying the same about us. Yes. Well, they are every Hopefully. couple of weeks. There's, oh, yes. you shouldn't have done this. Yeah. I mean, even if they didn't know about bacteria, they did know how to keep wounds clean. Yes. I mean, they could see as well as we can that dirty wound festered. Yeah. And sometimes they came across antibacterial agents by accident. For instance, they used honey on wounds presumably because it's sticky and would hold the wound together, but it's also antibacterial. Yeah. And I was talking to a friend who's a nurse, and she said they've just started using it again in hospitals. Really? Yeah. We always used it on our animals when they got injured. Yeah. And ourselves, actually. And they also use moss to pack out wounds and keep them dry, and some forms of moss, mosses will grow penicillin. So purely by accidents, these things worked. Yeah. Which, of course, then would just reinforce your beliefs. Hmm. Having said that, there are some pretty bizarre cures in the Middle Ages. And we saw a few in the syphilis episode. (laughs) (laughs) We saw some horrible ones. Here's one for gout. Okay. To cure gout, boil a red-haired dog alive in oil until it falls apart. Oh, my God. Why are they always horrific to something else? I don't know. I presume it means when it falls apart physically rather than mentally, because I think that would happen quite quickly. Then add worms, hog's marrow and herbs. Apply the mixture to the affected parts. Now, if you don't fancy that, you can take a frog Mm. when neither sun nor moon is shining. So now it'll be good because it's raining. So now we're into witchcraft. Cut off its hind legs and wrap them in a deer skin. Apply the right to the right foot and the left to the left foot of the gouty person. And without doubt, he'll be healed. I'm sorry, that's really disturbing. The patient will be healed, not the frog. I think the frog oh, no, had the probably had it by I don't think the patient will be healed either. Like, why do they kill things to cure themselves? I don't know. There's a touch of rhino horn about all this, isn't there? That yeah. Not, yeah. Or unicorn horn, specifically. Yes. I wonder if any... Okay, if you don't know this, they believed unicorns existed, and they could believe it because they could see the unicorn horn. But nobody ever told them it was a narwhal tusk. 
Which is stranger, I think. I mean, yes, you, get it is. Lot, you get a lot of sort of deer, deer type things and cattle yeah. type things with the weirdest horns. You don't get many fish with horns. <laughs> oh, no, just the one. <laughs> so I could quite easily believe in a unicorn, but I think, I think narwhals, no, they're definitely no. mythical. <laughs> yeah, especially when they tell you, oh no, it's not a horn, it's a tooth. Pardon? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, well, we'll do a thing on strange creatures <laughs> at some point. Yes. And we haven't, uh, oh, hang on. That's our, we're going to be doing a, <laughs> another, another episode. episode noise. <laughs> <laughs> so we've said it's quite strange that the Galen's humour theory lasted so long. But it is logical. If you have something wrong with your liver, you're hot and dry. You're choleric and touchy and aggressive. So what okay. you need are cool, damp herbs. So the primary job of the medic was to prevent or correct toxic imbalance with the use of hot, dry spices or cool, damp herbs. Right. Easy image to grasp, you're just rebalancing the scales. Right. I mean, anyone can imagine that, so you think... Yes. Yeah, fine, that's that's fine. Do that then. Yep. The look and feel of the ingredients for rem remedies were important. Red medicine was used on wounds that have been sutured, like this recipe. Red wine, hematite. There's, don't worry, there's no animal cruelty in this one. Red wine, red wine, hematite, nutmeg, white frankincense, gum, oh sorry, gum Arabic, dragon's blood, that's the sap from the Drycana cinnabari tree, which I think is the tree in the Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, oh. Bosch. I'm just doing yeah. the Northern Renaissance at the moment. And yeah, there's a picture of a very strange tree in it, and I think it's this one. Okay. Uh, and ground mummy. Now, mummy pops up all the time. I don't know if you've come across it. It's a bitumous, yeah. bituminous sort of cure-all, you know, whatever's okay. wrong with you, they say, oh, slap a bit of mummy on it. Okay. I don't know why it's called mummy. But, but the wine... the hematite? Hematite's a rock. Yeah. Wine, the hematite, and dragon's blood are all red. And so, therefore, uh. they cure problems <laughs> to do with blood. I wonder if that would be... If any of the iron from hematite would be absorbed. I wouldn't think so. I don't know. Can iron go, be absorbed through skin? I'm not sure. Well, if you've got an open suture. I suppose if you've lost a lot of blood, you've lost a lot of iron. I don't yeah. know. Well, did you know, sidebar, um, mulled wine, they used to heat it with a red hot poker. And they actually found when you do that, you do get a form of iron that is absorbable. So if if you were yeah, anemic, right. mulled yeah, wine that's... actually would make you feel better. Well, I remember that. If I become anemic, I said, I won't mm -hmm. bother with tablets. I'll just go for the mulled wine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you match the colour of the cure to the colour of the ailment. And also, again, we saw in the syphilis episode that people believe that guac worked because it came from the new world, as did the disease. Yes. So it was making connections with everything. Yeah. Obsessively so, really. Yes. That everything is linked in this system. The seasons, the elements, the four humours, the parts of the body, the personality, and how warm, cold, wet or dry it was. So we haven't got a quiz. Well, we have got a quiz. We don't have our normal quiz, but we're going to have this quiz. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Your face fell then. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> you disguised it well, but I could see what you were thinking. <laughs> quiz. Okay, I'll tell you, tell you the other links and you give me the remaining one. Okay. Okay. The elements air, the humour blood, the temperament sanguine. It was warm and moist. The affected parts of the body, arteries, veins, liver and heart. The personality, optimistic, courageous and amorous. What was the season? I would think that would be spring. Spring, yeah. For amorous? Am amorous usually goes with spring. <laughs> <and> <laughs> yeah. Okay, next one. The season summer. The humour, yellow bile. Nice. The temperature, choleric. Warm and dry, the affected part of the body is the liver, the personality, ambitious, passionate, aggressive. What's the element? So you're after air, fire, water, fire, earth, fire, yep. Okay, the element earth, the season autumn, the humour, black bile, the affected part of the body, the spleen, the personality, quiet, analytical, serious. What's the temp temperament? So you're after choleric, melancholic, uh, phlegmatic, or sanguine. So they're quiet, analytical, and serious. Sanguine? 
Mm. I think well, choleric is angry. Yeah. And that would go with fire. What were the other two? Sanguine, choleric, melancholic, phlegmatic. Well, melancholic is sad. Hmm. So could but it be it's... phlegmatic? No, it is melancholic. Oh. Okay, last one. The element water, the season winter, the humour phlegm, the temperament phlegmatic, as you would expect with phlegm, the affected part of the body, the brain, the personality thoughtful, calm, and apathetic, as if the three necessarily go <laughs> together. What would you be? Warm and wet, cold and dry, warm and dry, or cold and wet? Cold and wet. Cold and wet, yes. So you can see, apart from apart from the one... Yeah, it does have a logic to it. There is logic, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we can work it out from this distance in time, mm -hmm. and we weren't brought up to it, so imagine what, what it would be if that was your... That was how you you saw everything. And you were taught that way. Yeah. And you can see that everything, both inside and outside the body, was linked because it's uh, it's an anthropo anthropocentric system. Mm -hmm. Everything is there either to help or hinder man, and everything has put, put, been put there by God to help or hinder man. Right. What, wasn't there a thought, too, that if you looked at a plant at a certain time under a certain light, that it would tell you what it was good for? I know plants often look like the thing they're meant to cure, isn't it? That's why you've got lungwort. Yeah. Hold on, I'm going to see if I can find that. No, this, everything that comes up is why you should speak to your plants. <laughs> it's not what I'm saying. Um... I know there was one. I don't know. I'll have to look it up later, but I've Okay. Put it on I'm the, finding uh... them saying, yes, you can, but I can't find the word for what it's called. It was a study during that time, but they honestly believed that God put writing in the plants. And if you looked at it at the right time under the right light, it would actually tell you what it's good for. But I can't remember. I can't find what the name is. They're just talking about, yes, this is a medieval myth. It's not that surprising. I mean, the writing is a bit peculiar, but uh, if if God apparently wants to help you, he will leave messages. Yeah, so that's basically what that was, but I just can't find the name. Well, it's quite a comforting system because God is looking out for you. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah, and everything is linked from the minutiae of your bodily functions to the grand scheme of the cosmos. It didn't cure your ills. I mean, how could it? But it is quite comforting to know that you're part of a system. Yeah. I was thinking about that, like how comfort, how comforting it must be to have that kind of faith where everybody believes it so you have nobody to question it. But then I thought, uh, actually, no, because they believed in purgatory and that you were going to spend thousands of years in it Literally unless somebody prayed. Tens of thousands, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Well, did people actually expect to be cured by doctors? Well, what we can learn from court cases is that A, people did expect remedies to work, and B, they often didn't, judging yeah. by the frequency with which doctors were taken to court. Yeah, England, I've been looking at so many court documents that I found online, by the way. I found um, specific court cases. Mm. And England really liked to sue people. Like, they were constantly going to court. Yeah. Uh, most of it was for um, defamation of character and slander. All right. A lot of it was for slander. She called me this. <laughs> you sort of imagine that people wouldn't have done You just felt, felt in those days people would have fought their own battles and that now we go running to the police or the courts or whatever yeah, and no. saying it's not fair. No, they really like to go to court. Yeah. No, it's better than punching people, I suppose. True. <laughs> we didn't have um, a culture of vengeance, as some places did. Right now we I have this do. idea that everybody in the States sues everybody else. Mm. And that was actually what everybody thought of England during the War of the Roses and Tudor England. <laughs> you would have thought people were too busy. Actually, yeah. I say, having said that, the War of the Roses, 
didn't actually take up many people's time, did it? No, <laughs> no. that's the surprising thing. You think it encompassed the whole country, but it didn't. It was specific no. players. Most people would have no idea it was going on at all. Yeah. There were many remedies that people could make for themselves or have prescribed by the apothecary, but it was also understood that disease was a fact of life because Adam and Eve had been cast out of the Garden of Eden. I wonder if that made it easier to bear. I mean, they must have... I mean, if I had toothache, I would have been cursing Adam and Eve, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Why did you do that? Oh, it's only an apple. <laughs> uh, what may have kept them going was the possibility of a miracle cure, praying at a shrine, perhaps. And when we saw that Maximilian reckoned he'd been cured of syphilis by praying at a shrine, it seems mm. unlikely. I mean, a word could be a cure. The name of a saint or prayer could be written on a piece of paper and then swallowed so as to assimilate it, which was useful if you couldn't read it. You're still, right. you're still in taking it in. Mm -hmm. This was officially frowned upon by the church as it smacked of superstition, but often it was the priest who wrote the prayer because he'd probably be the only one who could write. Yes. But it wasn't all hoping for miracle cures. The, the resetting of bones was quite well advanced in the Middle Ages, at least in the Greek and Islamic worlds with the use of splints, devices for popping dislocated hips back into place, and a device a bit like a rack for manipulation, manipulating problems with the spine. Yeah. I mean, we tend to think of the Middle Ages as a time when seeing the doctor would be more dangerous than not seeing the doctor. Yes. But there were some things that they could do. Well, the setting of bones, I remember reading somewhere that it was actually the blacksmith that did that. Because oh they had the had strength, the strength. To, yeah. yeah, to pull it back into place. So you would go to the blacksmith for something broken, and you'd go to the barber for surgery. Mm. <laughs> it's one of those, excuse me? <laughs> Following the Ralph Wilford incident, do you remember Ralph Wilford? Vaguely. Poor lad. He was the pretender who popped up said oh. only Earl of Warwick and was promptly hanged yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> well following that Henry the Seventh became preoccupied with what lay ahead and how he'd, he could evade death and he was quite ill by this time seems to be clutching at straws mm -hmm. for instance he paid two pounds to a stranger of Pepignon or Pepignan as the Pepignese like to say that showed quintessentia from which what we get the word quintessential I mean up in this country we only ever use the word quintessential to say that something's quintessentially English when we mean thatched cottages and warm beer and oh, yeah. crick cricket on the green and that sort of thing. Do you, I mean, do you have a word that you attach to quintessential like this? I mean, you don't no. have quintessentially Canadian or anything. No, but most Canadians pride themselves on us being like a conglomeration of culture. Hmm. There's no politeness as quintessentially Canadian, I would think. We say please and thank you all the time. And when we don't hear somebody, we don't say, can you please say it again or pardon? It's, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we actually have a written in our legislation that an apology is not a, an admission of guilt. Oh. Because we apologize for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do too. But yeah, I don't think we have that quintessentially Canadian. Mm, well, quintessentia is was the fabled water of life that could cure everything from gout to tuberculosis to poisoning to troubles with devils hmm. and it could also restore youth to old men oh could yes. it now was it a natural viagra <laughs> <laughs> well it might have appealed to henry because when he was 50 he wanted to marry the margaret margaret of savoy and she was in yeah. her 20s so she yeah, he might have been thinking on those lines, might not he? <laughs> <laughs> Bloodletting, as we know, was a common form of treatment. Which I still don't understand, even even though they say you've got too much blood. I, I've never understood where that could come from. Why would you think you have too much? I think it's maybe if you're overheated, they think, oh, well, there we are. You're too full. Right. <laughs> maybe because you get hot when you eat too much perhaps you get hot when you have too much blood i don't know that speculation on my part yeah I don't know. the blood was a humor in its own right but it also contained the three other humors so that bloodletting enabled the body to get rid of surplus humors of all kinds oh. so purging the warm wet humor cooled and ventilated the body okay 
So the inter the internal excess of blood, I think I mentioned that, was actually called plethora. A plethora, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was that specific to start with. Yeah, I mean, we looked at that in the syphilis thing about how you took stuff to make you sweat and drool, didn't you? I mean, yeah. It was getting rid of all your extra humours. Yeah. Nasty. Yeah. Certain parts of the body were bled for certain ailments. So inner elbow for problems of the stomach and liver. Under the tongue relieved dizziness. Ooh, yeah. they cut you under the tongue? Or stuck a leech under there. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather live with dizziness, I think. Yeah. But it's similar to acupuncture in that respect, isn't it? Because you don't stick the needle in the bit where it hurts. You stick it somewhere else where it's meant to have a yeah a, a line going to it, isn't it? I'm yeah. not an expert on acupuncture, but I believe that's the case. And we were worried when hearing about the skin graft in the syphilis episode. So I seem to say syphilis all the time in these episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologise. Before we started doing this podcast, I don't think I'd, I'd barely used the word syphilis. No. But anyway, we were worried that the flap of skin that was cut from the arm would inevitably lead to the wound festering. Yes. But not only would leeches be used to clean the wound back then, and they still are, because my nurse friend said, yes, they're, they're using leeches and maggots now. Yeah. But they are, they are very effective. Leeches' spit contains not only an anticoagulant, but also an anaesthetic and an antibiotic. Oh, but none of this is for your benefit. I don't mean you specifically. I mean general mankind. <laughs> yes. None of it's for you. <laughs> I'm on my own. <laughs> but it's all for the leech. So the anticoagulant stops it choking on your blood clots. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. The anaesthetic is so that you don't feel the leech feeding and try and knock it off. Yeah. Okay. And the antibiotic is so that the leech doesn't doesn't catch any nasty diseases from you. From you. <laughs> 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 Even the leeches know to stay away from us. <laughs> like you're bad. <laughs> well, I suppose if, if you've got a leech, then chances are you're not very well. But as far as the wound cleaning is concerned, all this benefits the patient too. But that's that's just a side effect, really. Yeah. And isn't it the reason that leeches are called leeches is because that was the Anglo-Saxon name for the doctor. The doctor was the leech. Really? The, the creature's named after the doctor, which I always assumed was the other way around. Yeah. That the doctor were called leeches because they use leeches. But no, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. Yeah. Different parts of the body had links with different signs of the zodiac. When the moon was in that particular part of the sky, the humours were drawn to the corresponding part of the body. So Pisces for feet, Aries for head, Cancer heart, Scorpio genitals. I don't know why Scorpio genitals. <laughs> Where's Gemini? Uh, I don't know. I, mean, oh, I, copied, yeah. I, I think I had the whole list, but I only copied down a few. <laughs> yeah, but Leo either. Mm. These areas were avoided for bloodletting at that time to stop the patient from being overdrained because all the blood was rushing to that point. Oh, okay. You stick a leech on there and the leech goes... Vroom, <laughs> yeah, <huge. laughs> it explodes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the way you lived had an influence on your personality too. John Mandeville, the traveller. That's still considered a thing right now, isn't it? I think it is, it? yeah. He said that Northern Europe, not quite like this, though, that Northern Europeans were hardwired to wander. I mean, you didn't use the term hardwired, I would say. <laughs> um, they, they were hardwired to wander because the moon was their planet of, planet of influence. So they oh. wandered as the moon did. But the natives of hot India, on the other hand, were influenced by Saturn. So they stayed put. So there okay. you go. Now you know. My, my Indians don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Northerners do. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's one of these things where they state it as fact, and then you think, Indians do go places. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm pretty sure trade. <laughs> and Did some Northerners, think? like me, hardly go anywhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, he was convinced. Because cure was so hit and miss, it was very important to stay as healthy as you could. People had to eat food that was beneficial to their own humoric makeup if they were to remain well. Right. But this also reflected on their social status. Workers on the land, whose status meant that their feet were in the earth, should eat cold, wet foods, fish, cabbage, leeks, things like that. Okay. On the other hand, the aged or cowardly, I like the fact the cowardly have got their own <laughs> menu, and their bodies were seen as too wet and cold. And also royalty, whose bodies were seen as a fire that needed constant stoking. They should eat hot, dry food, such as nutmeg, cinnamon, 
lemon, venison, and red wine. Oh, so you're actually making them more hot and dry. You're not actually balancing them. No, it seems so odd, odd that monarchs were actually seen as a different entity like this, don't you? Um, we don't. I don't think we feel now that Elizabeth II needs constant stoking no. with red wine and cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. But you had to be careful not to overdo it. But presumably the red wine and venison. I mean, you're getting gout and cirrhosis of the liver, aren't you? Yeah. Both. Too many cucumbers being cold and wet would make you lethargic. Now, I remember someone in Totalis Rankium American Presidents being told off in a letter from his sister for not working hard enough because he was eating too many cucumbers. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, well, it was a bit baffling at the time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I think they made out that it might have been some sort of euphemism. Oh, yeah. But, but it's actually the humours. It might be. If it is, it shows that these theories hung on for a long time. Hmm. Fasting was important too, and it's one of the few routes to spirituality open to women in this patriarchal church. But fasting didn't mean not eating anything all the time. No. I know you think, lucky girls, you get to starve for Jesus. Yes. Well Jeez. Yes, and these, the priests must have said, that's fine. You can just not eat. That's fine. <laughs> 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 We'll keep eating over here. Yes, we'll do all the, <laughs> the other stuff. Right, how they saw the human body in the late 1400s. In the Middle Ages, anatomy lectures did use real corpses, but only to demonstrate ideas from classical texts. They weren't used to discover anything new, like we were saying. Mm -hmm. One person would do the dissecting, while another would sit in a sort of umpire's chair and read aloud from classical texts. Oh about goodness. what they would expect to find. And if they didn't find what had been written in the book, they ignored it and went with the book. <laughs> <laughs> There's proof right in front of you that it's wrong. <laughs> yes. And now I'm reading about Leonardo. You think, ah, he was streets ahead of these people. <laughs> it's a completely different mindset. As we've seen, the sumptuary laws dictating what people could and couldn't wear Yes. became a sort of shorthand for understanding that person's niche in the world. Yes. So too, the human body itself was a shorthand for understanding what that person was actually like. Well, this is presumably how Perkin Warbeck managed to convince so many people he was the Duke of York. Not only did he wear the right clothes that set him in the right strata in society, but his bearing and his manner and his appearance mm -hmm. said Duke. It didn't say Boatman's son. Right. So people thought, he must be a duke. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a duke. Walks Talks like, like a duke. A duke. <laughs> yes. He's a duke. <laughs> you could tell a lot, good or ill, just by the way the person looked. And people were so convinced of this that to alter your appearance, even to try and enhance it with makeup, was to risk changing your whole personality. And was really? frowned upon as a sort of deceit. Yeah. That's hilarious. People so do say, I mean, I don't wear makeup, but people do say that they feel more confident. In yes. makeup, don't they? Yeah. And some people say know. they're desperately shy, but they can go on stage and as long because as they've got their makeup. makeup. Yeah, who knows? Mm. The same went for diseases. Leprosy, some saw as an external sign of internal sin, and others saw it as a test of their compassion. But it was there for a reason, whatever the reason was. Yeah. yeah. I don't know which is worse, really. You're suffering because you're a bad person. Or you're suffering so that I can show the world what a decent How person I, I am. am. Yes. Uh, that just opens... If you consider that everybody who's ill is a bad person, that just makes it easy to shuffle them off out of society, which I guess leper colonies is exactly that. You're, yeah. We don't have to be compassionate because you brought it on yourself. Yes. But you can see why people were, weren't particularly sympathetic to, there we go again, syphilitics, because... Yeah. You could say they had brought it on themselves. Well, they did. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, not intentionally <laughs> no, for a lot but... of people, but yeah. <sighs> I like this. Why were some people hairier than others? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> At one point, there was a bear. <laughs> well, that's not, no, it's not we're descended from chimps or anything. Certain humoral fumes left the body through the pores. And these condensed and became hairs. 
heat was needed for these hairs to grow. And since heat rises, so hair grows more luxuriantly on the top of the head. Oh, my. Men had hotter bodies than women <laughs> and were therefore hairier. <laughs> and if, but, but, and this, this is the get out of jail card, if they were too hot, their pores would dry out and then they go bald. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> soft hair meant timidity and soft skin on a man meant that he was fickle as the dense vapours didn't settle on him. Really? So there you go. That's why men are hairier than women, on the whole. <laughs> The medieval mind saw the skin as facing both in and out. In, it meant it was safeguarding the secret inner life, and out, forming an external social character. The inside of the body was, to most people, a mysterious place. Yes. I mean, today we're used to seeing the insides of our body with x-rays and scans and things, but back then, if you were looking at the interior of your body, things had gone horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. (laughs) (laughs) So most people would have absolutely no idea what was going on inside their body. No. Actually, I was just thinking, I remember reading, and people all people should read this book because it's brilliant. It's going back a bit further than this. Pliny, um, Natural History. Pliny the Elder? Pliny the Elder. Yes. He said that he'd been told that the eye was connected to the brain. But he said, I don't think so. I think it's connected to the stomach. Because every time I've seen a man lose an eye... He's always sick. <laughs> <laughs> serious? Was he being serious or was it a joke? No, I don't think. I don't, I don't know. He was a clever man. I don't think he was. Okay. <laughs> I think he was just making making a point that he had seen a few of these, these events. Oh my gosh. I've never seen anyone lose an eye. Neither have I, thank goodness. Uh, Please don't. No. No. Just be careful out there. Mm-hmm. The soul. This was seen partly as, as an ethereal thing as we would think of it today. But it was also an entity that lived within the body. And it was a tiny replica of the person it inhabited, a little white, rep- a naked replica. So I so imagine they... it a bit like a jelly baby living inside you. <laughs> you know, the white jelly babies. Yeah. But... So they honestly thought your soul was completely separate from you? It wasn't you yourself? Well, it was living inside you. But it left you when you died, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I want to look further into this, but um, for a start, I didn't feel, you know, I was talking about bodies, really. I didn't not talk about the soul, but the implication was the body, mind and soul were all linked. And it was important to maintain the healthiness of these links. Mm-hmm. It was important, for instance, to eat correctly to keep the passageway between the body, mind and soul clear. So if you ate, for instance, a pot noodle, you risk losing your mind and blocking off the route to your soul. You have to eat healthily. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's hard for me to wrap my head around the soul being such a separate entity. It's like a little homunculus. Yeah, because when we think of it, our soul is our consciousness, but that's not what they thought. Well, it sort of is, because it does have religious implications, this, because eating badly was actually sinful. Yes. And eating too much was sinful. (laughs) Right, we've talked about normal bodies. Let's now talk about female bodies. Oh, this is going to be good. Yeah. Female bodies were thought to be subordinate to the male. And this was in part due to the basic humoral distinctions between the sexes. It was men who formed the true ideal for mankind, which is understandable since Eve was created out of Adam. Adam's rib. Yeah. Yeah. Not nasty, I think, that, isn't it? Yeah. This was especially true in terms of bodily heat, which meant that men grew larger and were hairier. And they were able to get rid of their humoral excesses by sweat and sperm. Women inhabited bodies that were colder and closer to those of children. Female growth was slower and they were weaker. And they were too cold to produce sweat and swer- sweat and swerm. <laughs> sweat and sperm. <laughs> so if you're wondering why you can't produce sperm, it's because you're too cold. Oh. The women purged their excess humours via menstruation. There was a sort of obsession with getting rid of stuff out of your body. Yeah. The colour, texture and frequency of menstrual blood was a sign of her personality, compliant or rational or bolshy. It does make you wonder what sort of men were keeping tabs on all this stuff. Yes. And it's a little creepy. It is. John Dee always wrote down when his wife was menstruating. I mean, John Dee, 
you know, I won't hear a thing again. He's my Margaret Beaufort, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was a little creepy and he did have reasons for doing it because he wanted to know exactly when his children were conceived so that he could make astrological charts for them. So right. it made a difference. But Okay, so that makes sense. But still. It does, but it's still not nice writing down when your wife starts menstruating, is it? No, for the rest of the world to know. <laughs> yes, hundreds of years later. The uterus, if not regularly purged through sex or menstruation, it could give off deadly fumes. Mm -hmm. Or it could rise through the body into the chest or head, causing fainting fits. It moved. I forgot. The wandering uterus. Yes, and I think they have a point, because if you suddenly discovered your uterus was in your head, I think you'd probably faint, wouldn't mm -hmm. you? So uh, this was a problem, especially for nuns. Because despite what Rex Factor would lead you to believe, sex with nuns was not as common as you might think. No, and it wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> no, but don't worry any, any nuns out there. The womb could be driven back down from the head by burning feathers under the woman's nostrils or by tempting it down with putting herbs and spices in the vagina. Oh, yeah, that's, that's safe. A bit like tempting a mouse from under the fridge. Great, so now it thinks. It not only wanders, <laughs> but it thinks for itself. A priest could also demand that the womb return to its proper place with an incantation. I mean, imagine oh. that situation. You've got a priest standing in front of you demanding that your womb leaves your yeah. head. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know I said that you should look for logical progression in all Tudor thought, but the, the logic escapes me with this one. <laughs> yeah, but if you look at, um, oh, when about was it? The Edwardian times. If you look at the exercise regimen... For women, it was entirely arms because they were still concerned that the womb would be moved. No, oh, right. What I was thinking was that hysteria was still said to be caused by the womb up until the 1950s. That yeah. was when it was finally expunged from the American catalogue of psychiatry. Yeah. Yeah. That was probably when they started getting more female psychiatrists, I should imagine, who said, <laughs> don't be stupid. Yeah. Yes. What is wrong with you? <laughs> right now's the time for you to grab your pen and paper okay pen and paper yeah we're going to look at tudor thought okay. so you can all play along at home the usual joke is driving Do uh, get your pencil thought? and paper out yep. <laughs> so i want you to draw a bald head in three-quarter pose looking off to the left so that you can see both eyes but you can still see, see quite a lot of the side of the head and make the head big enough so you can put a diagrammatical version of thought in it so that's going to be five circles and make a good job of it because it's this diagram will go on the website no no it won't <laughs> are you kidding i'm sitting here trying to figure out how to do three-quarter perspective <laughs> i mean just just a diagram it's you don't have to do shading or hatching or oil paints it's not going up on the website you can always do a, a good copy afterwards if you want. Okay. Now draw a circle behind the left eye and draw a line between the right eye and this circle. So going across. Okay. In the circle, write common sense. Oh, I should have made this huge. I made it tiny. <laughs> we could write CS and then we will remember. Okay. Right. This is where all the information gathered from the eyes first goes. Now draw another circle behind the left eye and draw a line from the right eye to that circle. That's what I just did. So we're doing it again? Oh, sorry. Right eye, left, left. The opposite. Do the opposite. Okay. Yeah, here he goes. And draw a line from the other eye to that circle. So you've got a sort of cross in front okay. of the eyes. And also draw in a line to the common sense circle, to this new circle. And in this circle, write imagination. And this is where images are built using the information that first passed through common sense. Okay. Now draw a circle at the top and back of the head and join it to the imagination circle with a, with a line. Okay. This is a little side route. In, the, in this circle, write estimation. And this part of the mind turns images into judgments. Here you would decide how to act on the images that your eyes have gathered. So, I mean, if you've just seen a tiger about to pounce on you, this is the part of the brain which would tell you to run, run. or fight or faint or whatever you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then draw another circle at the bottom of the head above the neck, but leave room for, for one more circle just below this. And join this circle to the imagination circle and write in it 
Cogitation. This is the part of the mind that turns images into ideas or concepts. Okay. One more circle just at the top of the neck and join it to the cogitation circle and write in it memory. And here is where your thoughts are imprinted after they've been through all these other processes. Now on that line that connects cogitation to memory, I want you to draw a little worm. And you can give it a smiley face if you want, just a little, a little worm. Okay. Right, this little worm controls the entering and exiting of thoughts to and from the memory. Oh my goodness. I mean, these days we'll probably put some sort of valve there, but in the late 1400s they went for a worm, so why not? <laughs> right, the worm does a little backflip now and then. And it, either, <laughs> <laughs> it either lets thoughts flow from cogitation to memory, and that's when you're memorising something, then it does another little backflip and lets thoughts flow in the other direction when you're trying to remember something. So you want something to go from the memory and whoosh back into the brain to remember it. And that's why sometimes you shake your head when you're trying to remember something. You're trying to dislodge the little worm to make it oh. do a backflip so it lets the memory through. I wonder if they'd be creeped out as much as I am with the idea with a worm in my neck. You don't want a worm in your neck? No. No. Yeah, it is odd choice, isn't it, a worm? Yeah. I mean, they must have had, you know, flaps or something that Yeah. In in other I was just thinking about in in mills. Don't they have a flap that opens up and the stuff yeah, comes down on the ground? Yeah. yeah. So why a worm? I've no idea I why a worm. Don't know. Hmm. So images come through your eyes, then they go to the common sense where you say, you know, okay, I know what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Then they go through imagination, where they're built up to make a sort of comprehensive whole. Mm -hmm. And then in estimation, judgments may or may not be made about what you've seen. So you might decide, you know, I don't need to do anything. It's not mm -hmm. a tiger, it's a cat or something. Then you turn the image into an idea before storing it in the memory. Now, to me, okay. that makes quite a lot of sense. Except for the worm. Except for the worm. I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> but... That doesn't seem crazy to me, the part no. of the worm. Hmm. Yes. And the duct between the different parts, the different circles in your head, they're filled with fluid. This fluid was clear and smooth in intelligent people, allowing thoughts to move effortlessly around the mind. Okay. But it was more viscous in people with lower intelligence, you know, who are called innocents, the ones that have trouble with differentiating between a goose and a capon, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> or indeed, women. Yeah. Yeah, we've got horrible viscous stuff in our head. Yeah. Yeah. Our weak and feeble minds. Yes. When we're too cold to produce sperm. I wonder what's the point of us. All we were there for was breeding. It's interesting that in Tudor times and before, all thoughts were images. Like maybe because to all intents and purposes, they were a preliterate age. Yes. Yeah, information was passed in to most people in the form of images. Yeah. Which leads us on to, how did the Tudors explain sight? There were two theories about sight. There was intromission theory. That is, objects give off particles and scatter them all over the place. And some of them hit you in the eye. Um, <laughs> well, it kind of works for light. <laughs> yes, it does. But people said, well, if things are giving off stuff all the time, why don't they get smaller? Yes. Or there was extromission. And obviously these aren't Tudor terms. These are later terms. <laughs> so. Beams were shot from the eye into the object, you know, like laser vision. And I came across, when I'm doing the research for Leonardo, he's done a picture of an eye in which light rays, and it's specifically light, it's not stuff coming off the Particles, object. Particles, yeah. Yeah, hit the surface of the human eye and are focused on the back of the eyeball. So he knew that. That's why Leonardo was a genius. <laughs> yes. He wasn't thinking about, oh, well, it's probably worms in your head. and Yeah. 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 Well, they must have known something about that because they were using the um, camera obscura by that time. They were, and I suppose we're not, not many miles off telescopes. No. So, but I mean, we're talking about different people, different times, but I suppose yes. this, this is medieval times and possibly mm -hmm. maybe England was a bit more backward than Italy, possibly. Well, I think Leonardo was kind of exceptional for his He was, yeah, <laughs> amazing. I'm 
reading about him, I'm just completely bowled over by him. <laughs> I have to wait for July for that. Whichever way you believe, intromission or extramission, there was a physical connection with what you were seeing, much more so than we would consider today. Okay. And the rays were brought, brought the object and the eye together. And this made sight a more powerful thing psychologically, since the viewer was directly affected by what they were seeing. And this is why ideally pregnant women should only see calming things, particularly oh. towards the end of their pregnancy. Yeah. Since the physical impact of the sight of something unpleasant could affect her child. Which so, is true. Under traumatic circumstances, women have been known to miscarry. Yes. I was just thinking, thank God they didn't have the internet then, because you come across all sorts of things inadvertently, don't you? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just don't. There are certain things you should not Google. <laughs> People believed that objects could assimilate the morals and spiritual nature of the person who perceived it and could then pass them on to somebody else. This is the object. So okay. an object that was used by a saintly person was imbued with saintliness, which could then be taken in by someone who gazed at it and venerated it. Right. Hence that religious girdle that Elizabeth of York used every time she went into labour. Mm. And at this time, only the priest took the host you know, ate the bread that represented the body of Christ and drank the wine that represented his blood, the rest of the congregation watched him do it. Apparently this was the only time they stopped talking. Most of the time they chatted through whatever the priest was doing. <laughs> but this was this was the big moment. Okay. And they had to watch because even though they didn't partake of the host themselves, the priest held it up for all to see. And so that's they got their spiritual connection that way. Oh. But I suspect that's the priest saying, no, no, this is my wine. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked the other way, too. Evil could pass through sight in the form of the evil eye. You were not just seeing the natural world, you saw the supernatural world as well. I mean, I suppose that explains belief in fairies, Everything. demons. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sight was, was perceived very, very differently. Yeah. The reason why people like to be depicted in paintings, along with sacred beings, for instance, Isabella of Castile with the Virgin Mary, yeah. and Pope Alexander with Mary, his mistress. <laughs> yes. Uh, you also see many <laughs> pictures of sponsors of paintings praying with the saints standing behind them. And this was because the sacred image could enter the soul through the portal of the eye. Prayer was a visualisation of Jesus, Mary and other biblical characters. And it was a powerful way to find salvation. And in fact, during the Reformation, they thought it was too powerful. You can still see in churches today that on some stained glass, the faces have been blanked out, and sometimes it's only the eyes. And mm -hmm. this was done during the Reformation in order to stop people trying to connect with the image as an intermediary to God. Because they didn't right. need to take out the whole figure. They just, just, the eyes. just hiding the eyes was considered enough to break the connection. Weird. And stop all this Catholic idolatry. Yeah. yeah, Catholic churches before the Reformation were full of images of the Bible. Mm. They were very, very brightly painted. Yeah. And then they were whitewashed. Yes. I was wondering whether the fact that the vision was more physical can explain some of the imagery in Shakespeare and other playwrights later. But actually, well, maybe, maybe we'll come back to that mm -hmm. when we get to do Shakespeare, which is a long way off. How did the Tudors explain hearing? Well, sound, too, had good and bad properties. It was the voice of the Archangel Gabriel that brought the Holy Spirit to Mary and made her quick with child, as they say in the Bible. Right. Because illuminated manuscripts show the spirit entering Mary's body through the ear. Okay. Mm. Hearing heresy was enough to get people into trouble. It didn't even matter if you didn't understand it. Uh -oh. You'd heard it. It was inside your body. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And it entered through your ear and you had assimilated it. Yeah, so that's why they say about speak no evil, see no evil, and hear no evil. Yes. Because it could get you into terrible trouble. Here we go with the Tudors. Deaf people were subjects of ridicule and sometimes became court jesters. And others were put away in asylums since their affliction was thought to be demonic possession. Oh. Yeah, because they couldn't hear the word of the Lord, they were said to be heathens. Oh, goodness. And actually unsavable. And sometimes they were banned from attending church. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's not nice, is it? No. No. How did the Tudors explain taste? Now, I would like, if somebody actually knows more about this than I was able to find out, I would like to know more. 
instead of the five basic tastes that we have now, sour, bitter, sweet, salty, and umami, which is that sort of fermented food taste, mm -hmm. the Tudors recognised nine, including oh. they had salty and salty like the sea. They were two different ones. Okay. S sour and vinegary were different ones. And I can't imagine the Tudors actually tasted things differently. And I can't think how you'd discover that anyway. No. But we know that if you've got more subtle ways of describing things, you can often sense things in different ways. Because I was thinking in Russian, they have different words for light blue and dark blue. And they actually see them as two entirely separate colours. Don't we? We have light blue and dark blue. We have light blue and dark blue, but they're blue. Yes. And we see them on a, as a spectrum of blue. Yes. Whereas apparently Russians see them as two different colours. Really? Because uh, I can't remember the names. No, I, didn't, I can't remember. I did oh. learn Russian, but I can't remember very, remember very little of it. Oh. So I think, yeah, I was wondering how that would affect if you've got more possibilities of taste. Do you get more subtleties of taste? I'm not sure. But I heard about it in the middle of the night. I was listening to a radio documentary called The History of the Tongue. And that was all the information I could find. I looked up, looked it up afterwards. I would want, like to know what were the other tastes that the Tudors knew, knew about, but I couldn't find anything yeah. on the internet. So if anybody knows what the, what the nine tastes that Tudors could taste was, then um, I'd like to hear. Hmm, me too. Hmm. What happened to the body after death? I got eaten by worms. That little worm in the head bred and ate them from the inside out. <laughs> burst its way out like uh, John Hurt in Alien. <laughs> well, today we do our best to keep our bodies intact before and after death. Even if we elect to undergo cremation, we prefer to be cremated as a whole. But not so at this time. It was not uncommon to have your heart buried in one place and the rest of your body to be buried elsewhere. Yes. And Anne of Brittany stipulated four different places that she wanted to be buried. And it was not either or. She wanted to be buried in all of them. Yeah. Because I, I found this odd, because when you're called up to heaven... You're called up as a whole being. Yes. You, you want all your bits and pieces in the same place, I thought. Yeah. People asked to be chopped up after death because prayers for the dead were most potent near where the body rested. Oh, so if you spread your body yes. around, they'd be potent in more places? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of your body somewhere else. You get three times the prayer power. Yeah, I mean, oh, surely it'd be best to get your body minced and sort of scattered everywhere. Ooh, that's horrific. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were serious concern about what happened to people who drowned and were eaten by fishes and crabs. And then in turn, the fishes and crabs were eaten by people because the crab eaters would then contain parts of the crab ETs. And what would happen then on Resurrection Day? Ugh. And people really panicked about this. <laughs> As if they didn't have other things to worry about. Yeah, the closer to the church you were buried, the better afterlife you had. And people vied with each other for the nearest burial place to the altar. Oh, is that why they were buried under the altars in Yeah, like, well, royals? most people had to make do with being as close to the church as you could get. But yeah, if yeah. you were rich, you were inside and you tried to get close to the altar. Oh. And because prayers for your soul in purgatory were more effective the closer you were. Okay. And I'm not an expert on other religions or indeed in this one, but... You don't find the same with mosques, synagogues or Buddhist and Hindu temples. Medieval Christianity really made a cult of being dead. They yes. were the ones who'd gone before, to, yeah. who, who knew the mysteries. But apparently they're sort of alone in that religion. Maybe if other people know more about other religions, they, they might say it's not the case. But it does seem to be a bit of an obsession when you get Memento Mori. And I was just reading about um, the Van Eyck brothers, the painters. Yeah. And yeah, Hubert Van Eyck, his gravestone says... I was called Hubert van Eyck, and now I'm being eaten by worms. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think of Irma Bombeck. She was a comedian author. She's quite hilarious if you read her books. Ah. And I believe her gravestone said, I spent my entire life trying to get rid of dirt, and now they've dumped it on top of me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a bizarre job called a sin eater. Oh, yeah. I've come across this. They ate part of the body to absorb this sin. Well, the one I've heard, it does not quite as gruesome as that. They put, or they put bread or something on bread top of the Bread and beer would pass over the dead person and then be given to the hired sin eater. And when he ate and drank, he took the person's sins on himself. 
yeah. that's smacks of desperation. I think that was probably to to make the family feel a bit better, really, wasn't it? It was a job, though. Where did I? Ooh, um, what what is his name? It's a British actor. Yeah, I know who you mean. Who yes. did uh, history's worst jobs? Yes. Yes. Ah. What is his name? He also um, narrated yeah. a whole bunch of Terry Pratchett books. Yeah, well, he's um, Baldrick in Blackadder. Mm -hmm. And his name is... Hold on, I'm pulling up History's Worst Jobs. Good, because <laughs> this could last a long time. Oh, I'm trying to get it before you do. Um... <laughs> uh, oh, Tony Robinson. Tony Robinson, damn. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that's where I've learned about Sin Eater was his history's worst jobs. Hmm. Well, that that desperate flail through our memory brings us to the end of this this episode. <laughs> so, from top to toe, that is your average late fifteenth century human body. That's a mess. It's an interesting conglomeration of stuff, isn't it? Yeah. And a completely different imagination. I mean, I didn't know I had a jelly baby living in me. I didn't know I had a worm in my brain. I yeah. didn't know I was shooting out lasers from my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a lot I didn't realise about my own body. I've no. Much wiser now, I feel. And from this point of view, I'm not surprised so many people died. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Especially if you bled them for practically everything. Yes. I mean, you quickly you quickly make it back, I suppose, the amount of blood that a leech would take. Yeah, but, but then you've got those that, how many liters of blood? Oh, I forget what it was. It was I was listening to something and they said, despite bleeding him or taking out oh, three or yes. four liters of blood, he still passed away. He still died, yes. Yes. And I was like, what the heck? So maybe they're not taking only a little bit. It sounds like they're taking a lot. Yes, well, they obviously took it from the wrong bit where the blood had all <laughs> shot there during a certain time of where the moon was. And if yeah. they bleed you every time you're hot and sweaty, any time you ran a fever, you'd be bled. Mm. And when you're sick, a lot of the time you're running a fever because you're fighting an infection. Yes. Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd take very kindly to bleeding because whenever I've given blood, well, the last couple of times I've given blood, I've passed out. Ooh. And one, one time I took the whole table of lemon squash and biscuits down with me. <laughs> <laughs> and the second time I was taken home in an ambulance. So I don't oh, no. think I bled. No. Well, that, was, that was only because they happened to be going our way and I could, obviously couldn't drive home. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I'd last long being bled. No. But then they would say, see, you fainted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you need to be bled more. Oh, yes, or you need burning feathers under your nose or Ugh, worse. <laughs> man, that would stink. Burning feathers, I think, really would, wouldn't it? Quite a... Yeah. yeah. Not unpleasant. Yes, I am quite glad to live in the 21st century. Me too. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure they had a lot of fun in those days and they may have a lot that we've lost now. They had a lot more days off. Yes, they did. <laughs> there were a ton more holy days, like 80 some odd. Yes, I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And some of those were like a full week or two where you weren't allowed to work. Yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah, it would be a sin. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting an extra one this time because of the Queen's Jubilee. Nice. So that's quite handy. We're getting the Friday off. Nice. So that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, <laughs> for that. Very cool. Well, that's the end of our episode on the human body. We yes. will have to put up the next four for people to vote. Yes. Well, we haven't decided yeah. what we want yet. So, yeah, we might decide over the next week or so who we want yes. to do. Yes. And, and then, start uh, putting them up. I'm a little silly. I started looking at people and then I was like, oh, I really want to do this person. And then discovered they weren't until the Elizabethan era. So I have to put them aside. <laughs> yeah, it's frustrating that, isn't it? It really well, was. Just... I was like, oh, I'd really like to do this person. He sounds really important. Oh, look at the date. Yeah, or well, they're too early and we'll never get to do them. Yeah. We're doing Leonardo in July and that's mm -hmm. definitely going to be a multi-parter. Yeah. The way I'm going at the moment, it's going to be a multi, 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 multi part. Which is one of the reasons why we gave ourselves such a long lead time. We really wanted to be able to get in depth with these people. Yeah, I'm on book two now. I'm sort of alternating between doing Leonardo and the other things we're doing. So yeah. uh, I've got a whole pile of them there. 
There's a few things that I'm kicking myself for not bringing into Isabella's, but she was already four, <laughs> four episodes. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to draw, draw the line somewhere. Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. Well, thank again, thank you very much for forking out money. Good, honest yes, cash thank for you. us. And we hope you're enjoying it. If you have suggestions, please let us know. Yes, we're open to any suggestion. I don't know when we'll fit it in. Because we have so many. <laughs> Somebody did suggest we did Margaret of Burgundy, and I said, "Don't you worry, <laughs> she will be done. <laughs> she is. She's on the list, definitely. In fact, we're oh vying each other as to who does her. <laughs> Not that we can choose, but something people might find funny. Um, the other day, I was wondering what I was hearing, and I discover Mike has gotten into my tutor person box. <laughs> oh, perhaps we should mention that Mike's your cat. Mike's my cat. And not your husband. <laughs> not my husband. No. Um, it's short for micro because he's got a tiny little squeak of a meow, even though he's a quite a big cat. <laughs> but uh, I heard him rustling. I was like, what is that? And then I see him grab one of the folded pieces of cardboard and run off with it. Right. And I've discovered a couple around the house now. So I'm wondering oh. who I'm missing. <laughs> ah, that explains why you said you had hardly any left in your box. And I thought, yes. that's odd. I've got loads <laughs> left in mine. Yep. Yeah. He has been stealing them. I found five in the house. So I'm going to have to go through <laughs> the list and reintroduce people. <laughs> So that's now in a cupboard <laughs> instead of on the desk. <laughs> yeah, because I was beginning to beginning to think, is it me or is it her? <laughs> but, <laughs> nope. Yeah, as far as I was aware, we've got years and years <laughs> left in my box. Yeah, and I was like, there's barely anybody left in there. That's so small. <laughs> So that's what I'm going to be doing this weekend is reprinting them. <laughs> right, <okay. them. laughs> oh, well, I sent you the list of the ones I've still got so that you, we can at least yeah. make sure we've got the same. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my little munchkin. Okay, well, I suggest we call it a day. Yes, thank you very much for listening. We will chat with you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.